the guy who conducted the ceremony on the day of the ceremony he wore a string of human teeth around his neck wow. and uh, quite incredible and it was just you know at the, he i was dense in way in the forest and he started chanting um and it was the list of names just chanting all of the names of one who'd been killed and every time a name was mentioned some one of the 30 or so very senior Quayo men who were part of it you know, you'd hear a wail or a groan or someone had fallen to the ground because that was the name of their son or their father that had been killed, you know. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, they weren't allowed to take revenge. So it was this incredible ceremony. Um, but anyway, that was, yeah, something quite else. But we had to do that in order to be able to safely send researchers up into the area to, to mm -hmm. do the, start the conservation work. Escaped Sapiens. On this episode of the podcast, I speak with Tim Flannery who's a mammologist, paleontologist, environmentalist, conservationist, and explorer. To name just a handful of his accomplishments, Tim was named Australian of the Year in 2007. He's discovered more than 30 species of mammals. He discovered Cretaceous fossils extending the Australian mammal fossil record back 80 million years. And in 2018, he played a key role in putting an end to a 91-year-old cycle of killings in the Solomon Islands that stem from the murder of two British colonial officers. Tim very graciously agreed to sit with me for this episode, and it's definitely one of the more interesting conversations I've had. We discussed first contact with indigenous tribes, tribal ceremonies, discovering new species, climate change, the value of money, and how to live a good life. I hope you enjoy. Did you have any specific questions? No, no, not at all. We can, we can go ahead if you want, but that's very interesting. So you're interested in cosmology is your thing. Yeah, I, my focus is particle theory and cosmology. I'm technically right. in the cosmology department here, but I actually do focus a little bit more on particle theory. Uh, so do you work at CERN very much? Never. I'm, I'm at the Max no. Planck, which is another institute oh, no. uh, in Germany. <laughs> yeah. I've actually never been to CERN. Um, oh, really? Like, no, no, never. Um, that's, that's part of phenomenology, whereas I'm on the theory side. So, um, oh, okay, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not useful in that building. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I, I've been there. It's an amazing place. It's fantastic. I would love to. I'd absolutely love to. Yeah. But um, all right. Sh should we kick things off yeah. and ask about you? Let's though? do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So Tim Flannery, welcome on the podcast. Thank you very much, Shane. It's great to be with you. So what I wanted to talk about today, uh, there's sort of two main themes I want to focus on. And the first is, you know, I want to understand why it is that there are some environmental issues that we you know, we seem to be able to approach decisively in a unified way. So, for example, ozone depletion and whaling are two good examples. And then other issues like, I don't know, climate change, you know, um, overfishing, we just seem to be in a complete shambles. And so that's, that's sort of the first theme I want to touch on. And the second one uh, is also just how to be pragmatic about our approach to environmentalism. So how do we make efficient use of the limited renewable resources that we have access to? And I guess a good, uh, you know, way of sliding into the discussion is how did you personally become interested in conservation and environmentalism? Because, you know, when I look at your background, you started off in what was it, English and arts. And then, I mean, you've made significant contributions in paleontology and mammalogy. So, so how did your focus shift towards, you know, protection, I suppose? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question, Shane. I'm not sure that, um, that it has shifted really. Um, you know, my... I guess my interest in, in science and in conservation started when I was pretty young. You know, I would, would have been uh, less than 10. And I was growing up uh, on the edge of a very rapidly expanding Melbourne. So Melbourne is now one of the world's great cities. When I was born, it was probably a million or two people. But the suburbs were expanding extremely rapidly. And um, it was that expansion was being done without the slightest regard for nature, as far as I could see. Um, you know, I, I, I remember my early childhood world was a world of tea tree scrubs and swamps and beach, which was full of life. You know, there was mm -hmm. there was goannas, there was uh, all sorts of parrots, you know, frogs and all that sort of stuff. And even as a young kid, I enjoyed that. I'd go out and make, you know, cubby houses in the scrub next to my house. But by the time I was 10 or so, all of that was gone. It had just been replaced wholesale with ugly factories and housing and all the rest of it. And I remember asking my mum why it was happening. And she said, oh, that's progress. And I thought, geez, if that's progress, I don't think I want to have anything to do with it. It's not, not great. And, you know, my one refuge was the, the, the bay, Port Phillip Bay. So I ended up doing a lot of snorkeling and fishing and things. Because the bay was, had withstood some of those early development pressures. Um, but even then, you could see them impinging. I mean, I remember 
our local rubbish dump was the most beautiful cliffs anywhere around Port Phillip Bay. People were just dumping old refrigerators and car bodies straight into the water and having oil leak out. It was pretty horrific. So at that stage, I think my kind of orientation towards nature had been set, that I, I didn't like what was happening and I was determined to do something about it. But are you is your time sh- uh, sort of um, shared between, are you still working? I mean, in the 80s and 90s, you discovered uh, many species. Are you still actively involved in that sort of research? Or? Yeah, look, I am actually. And, um, you know, I, I discovered about 30 new mammal species in Melanesia. Um, but, you know, that was a, yes, there was a, there was a sense of pure science in that, just the systematics of mammals. There was a sense of adventure doing all of those incredible expeditions or 25 expeditions to remote parts of Melanesia, climbing mountains you know, no one had climbed before, meeting tribal people who'd never had contact with the outside world. It was great. But there was also a sense of, I think, sort of like documenting a passing world because I knew mm-hmm. that, you know, the frontier started in Sydney in 1788 and was pushing up into the mountains of New Guinea. And I was probably, well, it turns out absolutely was privileged to be that last generation that could cross the frontier into another world, a world that was 60,000 years old and whose relationship with nature was was that old. Um, so there was a kind of a, I guess, a documentary conservation um, narrative in my mind about all of that as well. So, yeah, so they kind of ran hand in hand. And paleontology was just giving me the background. You know, what's mm-hmm. important in conservation? What are the oldest lineages? How have they survived? You know, how has the face of Australia changed? How's it likely to change in future? You know, it's, you know, they're kind of like they're interwoven threads in a larger narrative. I see. So, but so th- there was this sense that you had to document things before it was too late, uh, I suppose, early on then. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And I'd seen change in how quick it was and how aggressive the developed world was in destroying nature. So, yes, I think there was very much that. And those, you know, those programs of... Um, exploration and documentation have all pretty much turned into conservation programs. So you know, I've been involved in uh, developing two of the most important or most effective conservation programs in Melanesia, you know, the Tank Lake Conservation Alliance and the Baru Conservation Alliance in the Solomon Islands. Mm-hmm. So they are, it's kind of like, but to do that, you need deep roots in Melanesia. You need to have been part of the scene for decades, which I, which I have been, you know, so, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, and, and to be honest with you, that when I was doing that systematic work, I was a curator of mammals at the museum. I had obligations to the museum. I was in a discovery phase rather than an action, conservation action phase. I did some conservation, but they're both big jobs. Yeah. So when I was curator of mammals, curator of mammals is supposed to build up a collection of mammals and investigate the systematics of mammals, the, the evolutionary history of mammals. So I was doing all of that, which was a pretty full-time job for Melanesia, you know, um, and running conservation programs was really beyond my remit then. So it was a, you know, 15-year discovery phase. But once that finished, I then moved pretty quickly into conservation. So, you know, I established, along with Martin Copley, the um, Australian Wildlife Conservancy back in 2001, you know, and that's an organisation now, you know, looks after 6 million hectares of land and most of Australia's endangered mammals. And in New Guinea, you know, it's taken a lot of time, but with I've helped, you know, uh, Jim and Jean Thomas set up the the, uh, the Tank Lake Conservation Alliance, which, you know, that looks after some of the most endangered mammals in Melanesia. Mm-hmm. You know, and just five years ago, we started up the Baru Conservation Alliance to do the same thing for the Solomons. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're kind of like, all of these things take time. Can I ask, I think. the... the in those instances where you had first contact with peoples in Melanesia who may not have seen Westerners before, did they also have, I, I'm not sure how you communicated, but did they also have some feeling that their borders were becoming, you know, closer and closer to them and that, that the outside world, world was really coming in and things were changing rapidly or did they not see that happening? Oh, look, it varied. So just to give you two examples, um, and they're quite different in context, really. But among the Myanmar people in um, in, in uh, Sundown Province, which is kind of Western Papua New Guinea, you know, I made a couple of first contacts in that area. And those people, um, they had a very strong sense that they were the last. They'd been left behind. And, you know, they, they, they really didn't have a way of reaching out into the world. So 
uh, was really interesting with those people. Um, very different, very different to the situation in West Papua, which is part of Indonesia, where I was working in areas while where there had been contact, historic contact, but mm -hmm. there been there was no Indonesian government established, so they were outside the remit, and they would those people were desperately trying to defend themselves against the ingression of Indon the Indonesian military and sort of like the border, the frontier wars of Australia in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. And the communities, I, the main community I worked with then no longer exists. I mean, those people mm -hmm. have been, died or moved out. There's just a huge military base there now. Wow, okay. So, and that's just in the last 20 years. So, it, you know, it's varied. The experience of those people is varied. Have you had, uh, have there been sort of success stories where, where groups have managed to, I mean, have you been in contact with uh, groups for over 20 years and, and seeing them develop and somehow successfully uh, deal with the encroachment or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, uh, for example, in the, in the Solomon Islands, which is the most recent project that I've been working on, I worked with Quayo people and the Quayo um, have had a particular history, a really sad colonial history. So um, back in the, the 1920s, they, they killed um, uh, British and Australian colonial officers and about 15 highly armed policemen who'd come to collect tax. Mm -hmm. And the Australian government um, responded by sending a battleship and an army into their area to try to kill them um, or discipline them, um, failed miserably and then armed their tribal enemies. And so for decades, these people suffered and cut the outside world off completely. They just okay. would have nothing to do with it. And um, I started working there in the 80s, very, very fortunate to be able to go into that country. It was just a unique opportunity uh, to get in there. Um, but then in the, like about five years ago, um, I was invited to come back in and do some work. I managed to get some grant money out of Europe. And um, we set up a conservation program, but also a huge um, a reconciliation ceremony. Mm -hmm. So there was hundreds of people have been killed in this war. And... As far as the quail were concerned, it was still ongoing, you know. So they, the last Australian they killed or any of the quail killed was back in 2013, I think, or 2015, around about there. Guy was beheaded as part of this tribal war. And um, so we had to have a huge reconciliation ceremony where we paid compensation for uh, the hundreds of people who died. Mm -hmm. you know, we and went through a day-long ceremony. It was quite amazing. Was it pretty hairy originally when you entered the territory or i mean did you need some sort of protection uh, look, how was that organized i was very fortunate that i i met the son of one of the chiefs a man called folifo his son um who i knew was simon but that wasn't his real name had come into honiara and um a friend of mine had given him a swiss army knife and he was a bit overwhelmed at the gift and um invited us back to his country so we were there under his protection um so that was really just amazing experience to get up there and see. I mean, people living totally traditionally, no Western clothes, um, yeah. no Western goods, just, oh, it, I've never seen anything like it, you know. The sacred men's house still there it was just amazing. Um, so anyway, um, when I went back um, five years ago, it was the, the same sort of thing. We had this incredible ceremony deep in the bush, a thousand metres up in the mountains. I wasn't allowed to wear clothes for 10 days. I had to wear a leaf like everyone else. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, um, the guy who conducted the ceremony, I mean, he was, he was the defucker, his name is. He's an amazing man. He had a, he'd been preparing for six months to do the ceremony. And he, he, on the day of the ceremony, he wore a string of human teeth around his neck. Wow. And uh, quite incredible. And it was just, you know, at the, he, I was dense in, way in the forest and he started chanting. Um, and it was the list of names, just chanting all of the names of one who'd been killed. And every time a name was mentioned, some one of the 30 or so very senior Quayo men who were part of it, you know, you'd hear a wail or a groan or someone had fallen to the ground because that was the name of their son or their father that had been killed, you know. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, they weren't allowed to take revenge. So it was this incredible ceremony. Um, but anyway, that was, yeah, something quite else. But we had to do that in order to be able to safely send researchers up into the area to to do the start the conservation work and what form of compensation is it mon monetary or no pigs pigs and um shell money which is monetary for them but, but mm -hmm. yeah shell money which is highly valuable and, and the human teeth is that people who were victims of of this war or i didn't ask okay i just saw that 
you, you thought maybe it wasn't uh, uh, tactically maybe better not to ask, perhaps. Well, it was a like the ceremony wasn't about the teeth. You know, I was pretty deeply engaged in mm -hmm. just doing my bit for this ceremony. But what an amazing experience! Quite complicated. I, I, I imagine. I mean, this is an experience that you really can't have again uh, as, as the world opens up, right? No, this is the. I, I'd been working in Melanesia for forty years by that time, and I'd never been accepted into the heart of Melanesian wow. culture like that. You know, it was quite incredible. Were you, you were, were you able to record? No, well, no, the ceremony itself, we couldn't record, couldn't photograph nothing. But we there was 10 days of events and we, we did record quite a lot around, you know, the, the, the well, I should say there was a series of ceremonies that took place. So the ultra sacred one in the sacred grove where the ancestors skulls are and stuff that yeah. we couldn't record. But yeah. back in the village, we had a compensation ceremony where I had to pay compensation for the seven um quayo who had been hung by the british and mm. and they paid me compensation for the australians and british that they'd killed so that was all we, we could record that and that was all done you know recorded wow i i suppose that's not really first contact because they uh they were aware of white people it's but it's it's they that's may right. not have individually have seen uh, white people but still that's it, right it, it, hmm. It, so, so your research there, you, you're finding different mammals. Did you have a, a favorite mammal species that, that you found? Is there something in particular that... Uh... Yeah, there is, believe it or not. It's a, a, a tree kangaroo called Dingiso. You can find a photograph of it online. I'll chuck it's it up a on big the screen. black and white, you know, bear-like or panda-like marsupial mm -hmm. that only lives um, up in the very high mountains of West Papua. So and that we discovered that in 1995. I mean, to discover such a extraordinarily different and large mammal in 1995 was a it shocked me actually it made me realize how much remained to be done mm -hmm. wow the <laughs> i'm sort of I, I would love to have I, I, physics doesn't give me the opportunity very often to discover mammals uh, this <laughs> i'm sort of jealous of this line of work well you're doing more fundamental direction. stuff i guess yeah. Yeah. But okay, so let's let's jump into um some uh conservation uh, mm. or uh, climate change related topics. I uh I I'm wondering just to get a realistic view of of the position we're in. You know, how what, what's your view? Have have we are we in a position where we've lost hope? Uh, 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 have we gone too far? Or, or are there sort of realistic paths that we still have access to uh, to avoid the worst of, of things? Well, I think, you know, science is all about probabilities. You'd understand probabilistic yeah. things. So, you know, right. So on the balance of probabilities, I'd say we're on our way back to the Pliocene. So very different climate to the one we live in today. The climate that was existed three or four million years ago. Um, you know, and maybe that'll change. Maybe we'll pull up short of that. But, you know, I think that there'll be there'll be some fundamental impacts anyway uh, of a changing climate on humanity. Um, the extent of that change is still hangs in the balance. It depends on what we do in Glasgow and how much greenhouse gas we can get out of the air, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and those sort of things, how we adapt. Hmm. So, but if we do nothing and we just continue as we are, we're heading towards oh, we'll the end up. We'll end up in the air scene probably, <laughs> which is a lot earlier. It's like 50 million years ago, and that's a scary world. I mean, there's monkeys in the rainforests of Greenland back then, so it's, it's not a kind of place it's going to be very uh, good for us. But do you suspect this is something that we're going to enter uh, slowly, um, where in activity suddenly become it becomes obvious that we can't just do nothing? Or do you think we're going to hit a situation? I know you're talking about probabilities, but do you think we're going to hit a situation where there's a phase transition and there's some dramatic change that really we're too late? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, the, our, our yardstick for judging how fast change will occur, I mean, we have two yardsticks. One is the computer models which are based on um, our understanding of Earth's climate systems, but doesn't deal, they don't deal with disjunctions very well. They, they tend to be more smooth continuities and change rather than kind of like, you know, stock market crash analogies. And the second is the fossil record. And the fossil record as well is kind of blurred. You know, when you're dealing with an event from 5 million years ago, we just don't have a year by year analog record of what happened. What we see is a smearing of, events that may have occurred over years or millennia, you know, we don't know. So 
so far, most of the assumptions have been that it'll be smooth linear shifts. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what we're seeing in the real world is not really like that. So this heat wave that occurred in Canada and British Columbia recently was was definitely of the shock type, unexpected major event, you know, Mm -hmm. like Australia's bushfires were a bit the same. So my suspicion is we'll see some hard, sharp shocks and abrupt changes. Um, to a greater degree than, say, some of the, the, the modelers and others are assuming we'll see. You might actually be a good person to ask about this. In terms of the... Um, ex- have there been any noted extinctions from the recent fires that occurred? No. No, there's been no extinctions from the fires. A couple of species came close but have pulled through. There was a fish, a freshwater fish, um, that the last individuals were rescued just before the fire went through. And there was wow. a small carnivorous marsupial on Kangaroo Island that survived, I think, just in one colony, which is now subject to, to conservation measures. But we were lucky. We didn't and lose I, any species. And I suppose there, are, there must have been other species that we then have uh, examples of in zoos and, and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's, there's some species that yeah, are in zoos, but, but no, none of the others, as far as I'm aware, came close to extinction. And the, our, the best data we have for this, of course, is the frog work. There's a group called Frog Watch in Australia, and um, they um, record the, the calls of frogs, and they're the best survey method we have for species. I mean, a lot of species, insects, for example, you know, it will be years, if ever, before we know what the full impacts of the fire, fires mm-hmm. were just because there's insufficient survey work and they're very hard to survey. But the, um, the, the, the frogs, at least, are telling us that the species, by and large, survived and they're coming back after the fires. So I don't really understand that. So how, how do the frogs tell you about other species? Well, we are, we're using them as, an, as, a, as a kind of a, um, as a yardstick for the others. So if no frogs oh, went see, extinct, we just assume that the others have done okay as well. May not be right, but the, the reason we use the frogs is it's the only good data we have. You know, mm-hmm. data a strong sets, correlation right? between the survival of frogs and survival of other species. Well, not necessarily, but we're assuming that, right? Because mm-hmm. so you, you know what it's like. Just imagine you put out traps and uh, for mammals, small mammals, and one in every hundred traps gives you a mammal of the mm-hmm. species you try to census, and you do a thousand traps, so you've got ten data points, right? Yeah. But but for frogs, you've got thousands of data points because you've got people recording all over the country recording calls. I see. So you know it's just a richer data set, so we can use that rich data set to inform the response, post-fire response of mm-hmm. frogs, but we can't do it for a lot of other groups simply because the data is too thin. Mm-hmm. I suppose also Australia is just a very large country with a small population, so Yeah, exactly. Limited. Yeah, completely. So we can't, it, there's not enough scientists on the ground. Mm-hmm. So what makes climate change uh, one of those issues that we struggle so hard to approach? You know, in, in some syst- systematic and unified uh, way, what are the factors that distinguish it from for example, um, the ozone depletion. Well, Shane, when was the last time you looked at your superannuation fund and statement to see how much you're going to have to retire on? Pretty recently, actually, but I don't oh. often do it. You no. Know, okay. Well, I'm 65, so I'm retiring next year, and I check pretty often, right? Yeah. And there's something about human nature that, that deals with proximate threats. You know, we've got mm-hmm. this little thing in our mind that says, you know, how fast is it? How close is it? How big is it? You know, <laughs> coming at us and we tend to prioritise. So a lot of people, I think because they've thought that climate change is in the distant future, haven't thought it's worth prioritising. You know, um, we do it with COVID. I mean, that, that's a problem that, that can, you know, the, the threat can arise in weeks as, as that disease spreads. But for climate change where it's years, you know, often people tend to put it on the back burner. So I think that's one factor is that it's mm-hmm. just... It's not seen as being proximate. The other thing about it is that the background drumbeat for most climate change is a sort of a very, it's a slow unfolding. It's a, the best analogy is probably, you know, if you decided to give up exercise, eat nothing but hamburgers and drink nothing but beer, um, mm-hmm. you know, you wouldn't feel all that bad after a day or a week. You might adapt to the diet. But mm-hmm. a decade on, your body would be showing it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you think I'm feeling okay, but you might weigh 150 kilos and, you you know, haven't your yeah. heart's kind of struggling a bit, you know, but silently. And by then I'm addicted. Exactly. By then you're addicted and it's kind of too late. It's really hard to change anyway. So 
So I think there's a bit of that sort of, you know, that that phenomenon going on with climate change that we, you know, we, we, we're, we're kind of, the world slowly bakes. Year by year, things go by. It doesn't seem all that much worse, but we're locking ourselves into a poor outcome. I guess also uh, with things like whaling, there's, you know, you can point the finger at the people who are doing the whaling and it's just a single commodity. You know, you can, yeah. I suppose, if you don't use that commodity, it's easy to point the finger at the people who are doing it. Whereas with climate change, it's sort of across the spectrum. It's just con consumption in general. And we're all sort of complicit in our own small way. So it, it, the problem yeah. is larger in that sense as well, I suppose. Look, it it is. I think if you go back on the history of the anti-whaling movement, though, you'll see that the, none of those battles were easily won. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of struggles we're having with climate change were being had, you know, for many years by those who were pushing to to stop the extinction of the great whales. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think all of these battles are tough. Yeah, um, climate change is particularly tough because the the industry that's got the most to lose, the fossil fuel industry is used to lobbying their, their, their whole, they know that their future depends upon stymieing action and has mm -hmm. for many years. I mean, uh, you know, no one knew more about climate change in the 1980s than ExxonMobil. Uh, and what they drew, the conclusion they drew from what they knew was that unless they could stop action uh, against climate, against you know, the fossil fuel industry and climate change, they wouldn't have a future. And so they invested very heavily in that. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm sort of interested in is uh, government action. And, and sort of a game theoretic or political approach to solving these sorts of problems. So to what extent do governments, in some sense, implement less than ideal or bad policies because that's all they think the public will uh, be able to accept? Or, you know, is, is there some political move maneuvering that's going on with hands tied behind their backs because they have short terms? Or, you know, is our system not well set up uh, for this sort of problem? Yeah, I think the, the kind of, well, you know, we've got a number, obviously, of different governance systems around the planet. But if you look at the parliamentary democracies, um, I mean, they vary greatly among themselves too, but, um, but they have a number of vulnerabilities that, that make it hard to take action. You know, the, the party system, the party political system uh, makes it extremely difficult. Um, Often the, the governments are, you know, they hang by slender majorities or they can easily lose at the next election. Um, the lobbyists, of course, are all over the shop, you know. Um, and, and we saw in Australia with the mining tax lobby, you know, the miners just needed to spend $30 million to convince Australians that the mining tax was going to be a catastrophe for the country, when in fact it would have been one of the best things to happen. But, you know, that's just the way it is. So, yeah, it's hard. It is hard, but the good political leaders um, that have taken action have really shown the way forward. Mm -hmm. So people like uh, the Premier of British Columbia, um, Mitchell, I'm trying to remember his name, um, but he was he was great. He, he brought in a carbon tax, gave the money straight back to the people. Um, you know, there, there wasn't a, a murmur and they've got a very effective policy base there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if we want to, uh, if we actually want to be pragmatic about our approach and, and take reasonable steps towards solving this sort of problem. Uh, I mean, what, what should we be doing? And I, I guess that question is a little bit too broad. So let me sort of <laughs> narrow it a bit. You know, for example, should Australia be making use of nuclear power? Uh, just as an example. Well, no, Australia shouldn't be making use of nuclear power unless you want to spend a lot of money for your electricity, your power. Mm -hmm. So uh, nuclear power is massively expensive. Um, the units that, that are needed to, to generate it are like 2000 megawatts and above. So you've got to reconfigure the grid, um, you know, and, and you, you it, it, building a nuclear power plant in Australia is likely to take 15 years minimum. Mm -hmm. And by then we're kind of out of time and out of options anyway. Yeah. Time is a really important element in terms of dealing with climate change. But what should we do? Well, the, the general uh, approach is very similar, I think, to what we saw with COVID. So, you know, the first thing we have to do is stop the problem getting any bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with, with COVID, we knew what that meant. It meant a hard lockdown. You know, we locked down cities and people, took a hit to the economy, but the economy bounced back strongly at the end of it. We knew, knew that was mm -hmm. needed. Um, and in, in terms of climate change, um, the thing, it's, it's the same. Uh, what we, we need to do is to stop or cut the use of fossil fuels year on year by 8%. That'll stop the problem getting much bigger, Yeah. 
So if we do that, we can we can decarbonise by you know twenty thirty, and that's that's really what's needed, or the mid mid twenty thirties. Um, so that that's pretty plain. The second thing you need to do is have enough emergency capacity to deal with the consequences of your previous actions. So you know in COVID we knew what that meant. Yeah, it meant contact tracing. It meant um, ER services, really you know adequate um, uh, uh, medical response. In terms of climate change. I mean, we need to have an eye on everything from sea level rise to damage to the Great Barrier Reef to the impacts of heat waves, impact of species extinction. We need to have a, an emergency room big enough to look after all the casualties that we're going to create with this, you know. And thirdly, we need a vaccine. And, you know, I remember when the COVID epidemic broke out, my scientific colleagues were saying, look, we don't, there's never been a, a vaccine for a coronavirus. We don't know whether one can be made. But we do know that it's going to be very expensive to do it and it's going to take a long time. And that proved right, you know. Mm -hmm. So in terms of climate change, the vaccine is really the drawdown of CO2 from the atmosphere through strengthening the planet's capacity to self-regulate. So growing back the forests, looking after the health of the oceans, you know, mm -hmm. um, using silicate rocks as, as the earth has done, you know, the decomposition of silicate rocks to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we need to do that at a scale that makes a difference. And that scale is like 10 gigatons a year. And we're nowhere near that. What are we at currently? Oh, we're still nothing. emitting, you know, still almost nothing, yeah. yeah. No, no, I mean, if you, okay, discount uh, the what we're putting into the air. If you just look at the technologies there that are drawing down that we have, yeah. what, what well, are they if doing? You, if you look at human intervention, so probably the best stuff would be land-based reforestation. So, you know, that we might be getting a gigaton a year out of that with all the reforestations going on. But then again, there's a lot of deforestation as well going on. So, yeah. right? so we need to tip that balance strongly into the positive. But can we plant our way out of this problem? Probably not. Do we have enough land no, to do that? No, we don't. Nowhere near. So we've got to use the oceans, seaweed, oceans, silicate rocks, um, direct air capture. You know, there'll be this whole series of approaches that, that might mm -hmm. form part of this vaccine. Before I ask a bit more about that, is there a place in your mind, when people talk about clean cold, is there any way that they have a point? What, what's the, what, if, you, if you're looking pragmatically at, at what people are saying, is, is there any place for those sorts of arguments or not at all in your mind? No, there's, there's no, what, what is clean coal is a meaningless concept. Burn coal and you'll get CO2. So if it's pure carbon coal, the best coal you could get, you burn a ton of that, you'll get 3.66 tons of CO2. As you know, mm -hmm. it's you know almost pure carbon, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's a big pollution stream. So, no, there's no such thing as clean coal. If you want to use carbon capture and storage to capture all that CO2, you can do so, but the costs are very high. And we've had numerous experiments and facilities being built and run, um, but mm -hmm. closed down after a time because they're just not economic. Mm -hmm. When people are talking about that, though, do they mean sulfur content? What do they? I mean, if you took the worst coal and the best coal, do they still release the same amount of carbon into the atmosphere and the other chemicals you're worried about? What 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 are people talking about there? Well, I don't know what they're talking about, Shane. It's 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 a mystery to me. But you know, the best quality coal we have is high in carbon. Yeah, the highest carbon, mm -hmm. less ash, less sulfur, and you know, burn a ton of that, you get more CO two than you would from lower quality coal, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of mystifying what this all means. Okay. So one thing I'm curious about is how to make... So you, you mentioned uh, seaweed, you know, these yeah. seaweed farms and, and these other um, approaches. I'm, I'm interested in how, how to make those economically viable. So, so I, I know you have a, a TED... Uh, is it a TED talk you have? Where yeah. You, where you, yeah. yeah. Um, where you discuss... Um, I think the solution is you, you grow huge amounts of seaweed and then you cut them and they sink down into the lower, uh, you know, the deep ocean yeah. where they sort of, is, is, so two questions, is that damaging to the uh, deep sea ecology? And, and secondly, um, how, how do you, how do you monetize that? How do you make that um, financially sustainable so that you can, you know, scale up and, and, and actually make it into something that we is, is practically usable? Yeah. Well, look, Shane, could I just go back to clean coal briefly? Um, sure. Clean coal is just, just, it's just um, a misleading thing, right? It, there's no reality mm -hmm. behind it. This is just kind of, I don't know what you call it, um, advertising speak, right? To try mm -hmm. to get people to burn coal, except they're burning a coal a little bit longer. 
It's bullshit, mm-hmm. as we'd say in Australia. Right? <laughs> okay. So, but to go on to the, how do we commercialise CO2 drawdown? So with um, seaweed farms, you can um, obviously uh, grow seaweed. You can you can create an ocean permaculture, which would be mm-hmm. a system whereby you're growing high quality protein in the seaweed because the you know mm-hmm. fish and shellfish grow very well in seaweed because there's mm-hmm. the waters are less acid. It's easier for them to grow and they're sheltered there. Yeah. But you could also cut that seaweed, use product from it and have some, you know, some of the offcuts go into the deep ocean. That might work as well, but it's obviously a much lower scale of, um, of sequestration. How do we know it's not bad for the deep ocean? Well, we don't know, but, but what we do know is that a lot of seaweed reaches the deep ocean naturally. Right. Mm -hmm. So how it's a question of scale. It's, it's like the old um, doctors believe, you know, the poisons in the dose. So we don't know what the yeah. dose is yet, right? We don't know. We're, we're mm-hmm. just starting to experiment with that. But let's look at some of the other options too. So silicate rocks, sure. for example, grind up a kilogram of high quality silicate rocks and you draw down 1.25 kilograms of CO2. Yeah, mm-hmm. And those rocks um, can be spread on fields, agricultural fields, and recent trials have shown that you get a crop enhancement of you know between 10 and 20%, depending on the crop, mm-hmm. just from the minerals in those silicate rocks. So that's a benefit. Whether it'll pay, you know, what the industry would wash its face with those sort of enhancements, we don't know. But th- there's something there, you know. Um, farmers who replant their, 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 their paddocks to 20, 30% trees get a benefit. They get uh, more soil moisture, less wind damage, um, you know, a better crop, a better uh, livestock survival and so forth. Mm-hmm. So we know there are benefits to a whole lot of these things. Um, but they need to be kind of weighed up and quantified, I think. Um, the other way of doing it is just to, to pay people to draw carbon out of the air. And we're already seeing that, you know, people are paying for offsets, as they call it, but they're willing to pay a certain amount to see CO2 drawn down. Now, whether those offset payments will ever reach the scale required is a very, it's an open question. We don't know. But there are various models that might work to, to, to uh, draw CO2 out of the air uh, in a way that can be paid for. Mm-hmm. I suppose one of the difficulties here is all of these approaches, the costs are somehow visible immediately, whereas when you're burning fossil fuels, you have hidden costs, which are down the line. And so the competition is sort of stacked in a way, and it's hard to get the ball rolling. Um, and so there must be, is there, do you, do you see um, a need for carbon taxes and, and, and this sort of thing being implemented? Well, look, in some cases, carbon taxes will be very useful. But we've reached a situation now where the technology for clean energy has changed so quickly and the economics of clean energy has changed so quickly that the cheapest energy is the clean energy. So Mm -hmm. just stopping subsidies to the fossil fuel industry would do a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to to subsidise the clean fuels or even have a carbon tax, but just stopping subsidies to the fossil fuels would, would hasten a transition and save us a lot of money. On what what scale are those on uh, in Australia, for example? Do you, do you have some idea? Well, they're billions and billions of dollars. I mean, you know, every farmer and every miner gets a thirty eight percent tax credit on on the um the 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 the, the, the uh, diesel fuel they burn. You know, they mm. they don't have to pay the the the, the fuel tax. So that's yeah. a you know tax credit. Um, they can write off all of their their stuff. I, I guess write down all of their fossil fuel things. So, you know, cars with just their, their vehicle fleet, you know, the way that the tax system's set up in Australia, um, you can claim, uh, you know, fringe benefits, um, mm-hmm. for, uh, reduction of fringe benefits tax for everything from, um, you know, your servicing of your, your vehicles through to your fuel. Um, and of course, none of that really counts very much for electric vehicles because they don't need much servicing and they don't need fuel. Mm-hmm. So... So the, the tax system is giving a lot of money away to the fossil fuel industry. Which is kind of insane given the situation that we're currently in. Yeah. <laughs> so what about uh, geothermal, for example? I mean, Australia, I, I know you've been involved in geothermal uh, projects. What are the, uh, are those options viable, do you think, in, in the long term? Or? Look, they're, they're technically viable, but they're not economic anymore because the cost of electricity from um, solar and wind has just declined so greatly. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. they are the clear winners in this. They've beaten everything out of the field, including geothermal. So, you know, uh, I, I think that 
it, it's going to be renewables. It's going to be solar and wind into the future. Hmm. And I, I suppose out of those, Australia probably does best with solar. No, we, we've got some of the world's best wind provinces in Australia. Really? As well as solar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right across southern Australia, just on the edge of the continent, there's the roaring 40s are just are some of the most reliable wind um, you can get anywhere. So, yeah, hmm. we've got the lot. Uh, have you seen, I mean, when, now when you fly over Europe, you look down and it's just as far as I can see, you can see, you know, wind turbines. Yeah. Are, are you seeing that come online in Australia to the same sort of extent or? Oh, the wind turbines, uh, the, the wind farms are growing, but they're nowhere near the same extent. And I guess when you look at Europe, you know, we're going back to the 18th century, aren't we? You know, the Dutch and their windmills. There was, you look at, you know, old paintings, there were windmills everywhere in Europe mm -hmm. in the 18th, 17th, 18th century. Um, so we're going back to a time where the wind is being harvested again. So I realize you've, you're short on time. So I want to uh, finish up just uh, a few very quick questions about uh, pragmatism. Mm. So I know you've, you've had these comments where, you know, we should be making efficient use of all of our renewable uh, resources. You know, don't overfish, don't, you know. Mm even to the extent where, uh, for example, you've made comments like maybe we should consider, you know, whaling or, or some other activities in sustainable ways in order to save, uh, I, I see your sounds just dropped out. You, you made comments along the lines of, you know, should we be considering um, sustainable whaling as a potential um, uh, possibility in order to save uh you know, overuse of land and this sort of thing. So do you, do you have some comments on, on how we should be approaching uh, the use of our resources? Yeah, look, I think, Shane, these are really deeply philosophical questions, you know. And I've worked with tribal groups where no one would think about destroying their sustainable resources, their forests, their birds. Everything is carefully shepherded and husbanded. They understand that, you know, what they have... Is, is has to be valued and passed on to the next generation, you know. And there's a very different mindset in, in those communities about what is important, what, what's a good life look like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, compared with our uh, many people in our society. So I, I, I think I look around at my own Australian society and see people accumulating wealth to a vast extent that actually makes them miserably unhappy quite often. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 it comes at the degradation of their social capital. So many very wealthy people don't know if someone who's being friendly with them is being friendly because they just want to be friendly or, or they want something out of them. They want some money out of them. Their own children often get alienated from them. I mean, you see it with, you know, some of the wealthiest people in Australia that, you know, there's, they're always in the courts arguing about money, parents and children, you know. Um, mm -hmm. it, to me, the accumulation of wealth at that level is as obscene as extreme accumulation of body fat that can just, you know, handicap people um, in terrible, terrible ways and destroy the quality of their life. So I think we're just, you know, they're really deep philosophical questions that need to be looked at. And, um, and, and they come down to what is a good life like? And, mm -hmm. and that should be our guidance, really. What role does money play in this, you know? I mean, if you look at the economic effort that, that goes on, Shane, most of it's not paid for. I mean, you know, it's, it's the caring of mothers, of, of, of children for their parents, um, you know. I mean, most of that effort is unpaid. There's a tiny little pinprick on the top that's paid, you know, on the mm -hmm. top of that vast mountain of effort. And we consider that the economy. And I just think that's a bit mad. You know, I think we need to really have a deep look at what a good life looks like. And, and, and look at that in the economic context and, and everything else, because otherwise you end up uh, with these situations that make no sense, you know. Mm. There was a guy, like, can I tell you a story about Melanesia? Because sure. I know it a lot, right? So in Vanuatu, people, the wealth there is pig tusks. And if you can ever get a pig tusk that goes three times around, makes three curls, it's so unbelievably valuable, you can charge people a whole pig just to look at it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And so if you ever get to that stage, people get really wealthy. And what the wealthy, they're usually men, what they do is they proclaim their own death. So they say, hold a funeral for me now. I'm, I'm going to proclaim my own death. And people have this massive funeral where they give everything away and they then enter this refined world 
where they are so respected. You go into a house, you're fed no question. <laughs> you're kind of like, you're, you're kind of entered a new realm of being, you know. Um, and, and so they, they, their social credit is beyond anything, yeah? They're just, they're mm -hmm. right up there with this massive social credit. And that looks like a good life to me. If they'd held on to the pigs, the pigs are nothing but worry. They've got, you know, the wives are working, you know, 24 seven to feed the pigs. It's, it just, you know, making new gardens. They're in a world of toil, but once they give it all away, they enter this world of social credit. That's a different sort of world, you know? Did you meet people who had gone through this process? Yeah, yeah, I have. I've been to Vanuatu. And I've never met anyone who's grown a three ring tusker though. But there was one <laughs> bloke over there who was growing rats because rat teeth grow mm -hmm. perpetually too. And this was, he was had a, this was like Bitcoin for, for Vanuatu. Yeah. He was growing rat teeth that would curl around three times. <laughs> How did he prevent them from being worn down? Oh, you've got to knock out them? the upper teeth, knock out the upper incisors, and the lower ones yeah. keep growing. And so that's what you do with the pigs as well. So, but yeah, so, so people's <laughs> idea of wealth and credit, and, and it, it's kind of, it's infinite. We, we live in a world of infinite possibilities, and people mistake their own culture for some sort of reality, which it's not. You know, there are a million ways of doing things and thinking about things and being in this world. So I think if we looked a bit more widely, we'd all be, we could find ways of being much happier. Can I ask, okay, so Australia has 25 million people on the continent. It's not many people for a continent, but in your view, so you, you talked about having a good life. Mm. Is, is it possible for Australians, all 25 million of us to have a good life uh, on the continent or is that, or is that already too many people? Uh, and, and then I guess the same question, yeah. but on the world yeah. uh, scale. Well, it depends upon how you define a good life. And that's the problem. If we want to keep burning fossil fuels and accumulate immense wealth and, and, and do nothing much else, then probably not. If you want to mm. have a good life in a, defined differently, I'm sure we could all have a great life in Australia. It's, it's interesting. I think, you, you know, the questions that you sort of um, were bringing up, they are sort of existential questions, really. Uh, we're in a very interesting period of human evolution where these questions are now coming up, you know. We've solved yeah. some of the basic problems of find many of us finding enough food. Um, you know, when we're, we're, we're now pursuing, uh, you know, what does adequate governance look like? And what, what's a good mm -hmm. life look like? They're all you know, yeah, interesting questions. I guess when I was reading up on your background, I had, I, I don't know if this is weird to say, I had sort of this romanticized view where you were early on in your career going through this period of discovery where you were finding, you know, fossils from 80 million years ago or from mm. way back when. And then, you know, you were um, discovering new species and mm. going through Melanesia, meeting with interesting people, exploring. And then, you know, later on, there was this sort of drive to protect and this other yeah. sort of but, but that's not the case right you're still no. it sounds like you're still exploring i am still exploring but i've got more time to protect now as well i have for the last 20 years you know, I, yeah. I mean I, I, yeah, I resigned from that museum job i loved it it was a job for life you could do whatever you wanted but i needed to move on to do other things so yeah are you and you're into scuba diving as well i was yeah i, I haven't done it for years now but i was when i was a kid yeah very much I've loved it. I've just gotten into it. I, I love oh, it so great. much. Where so do you nice. do it in Berlin? No, well, not in Berlin. No, no. Actually, I, I have a I have a good friend here in Berlin who's a clearance diver, um, oh, yeah. and so he definitely does oh, well. do scuba diving in Berlin, yeah. but for other reasons, finding bodies and whatnot. But right. um, I the I've only actually been twice. So once mm. in the Caribbean and and oh, wow. uh, then yeah. off the coast of Africa in the Canary Islands. But I'm hope, hopefully going in a couple of months to Malta. We'll see. Oh, fantastic. Great. Well, I love Berlin. It's such a great city. I, there's so much to enjoy there. It's a, yeah. so interesting. It's a great social hot pot, hot bed of social experimentation. I think, really interesting. Yeah, I know. I've I've loved it. It's one of the reasons yeah. why I enjoy being here. Yeah. I, I, you know, another thing when I was reading up on your background. I don't understand how on earth you've managed it, it. I felt like I was reading the life of multiple people. I, like, <laughs> I don't know how you manage to do everything that you've done. It, it's are you just, do you sleep? Yes, of course. I'd sleep a lot. I, I do. I, I need my sleep badly. I probably sleep nine hours a day. Um, I don't know. I just do. I think you've, the risk taking, calculated risk taking has been an important part of it. It sounds like also you're building up social capital rather than uh, yeah. wealth potentially, which might exactly. help uh, and open doors for you. For That's, example, going to see 
old tribes in, in Melanesia and various other places. But uh, well, exactly, uh, it, it is. Life is ultimately about social capital, huh? Because it's that's the ninety nine percent of effort that's out there that's not in the corporate system, not in the financial system. You know, and what you can buy is a pale simulacrum of it. You know, even going to the best nursing home in the world. Um, you know that you're paying for with money. It's not like being looked after by your family. It's, you know, yeah. it's kind of you know when you're old or whenever when you need help. You know it's not. Yeah. So I, I think that we've kind of got a bit of a dead end with um, with capitalism. There's a great book if you ever get a chance to read it called Mariner's Tonga. Mariner, yeah. as in, I'll give it, and it's, it's an account of a sailor, a, a, a boy, a cabin boy who was shipwrecked in Tonga in 1802. Yeah just at the time King Finau was building the Tongan kingdom. And um, it, it, Finau asked him about money. And it's this fabulous discussion about what money is and, and, and what it does. And the king's having difficulty kind of understanding that these little silver discs are of, of any value, you know. And one of his counsellors, sorry, oh, shit. Oh, oh. oh, I've got a cramp in my leg. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I better... You okay? I'll, I'll keep on talking. But um, yeah, yeah. He um, one of the councillors says, "I understand it. This money, it's got no value at all of its own right, but it stands for something, and you can use it to 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 as a kind of a a substitute for other things." And oh, still, oh shit, this is really painful. Are you okay? Well, that's better. Is this common? Are you? Is, is that? Sorry, I've got to bend wife? down now. I'm giving myself a cramp. Um, yeah, but he said um, it's 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 of no use whatever. He said, but you can use it as a substitute for anything else. And what it does then is allow you to keep that thing. So if you want pigs, you can use money to buy pigs. And the king said, well, money will never. He said, I never want to see it in my kingdom. He said, it'll make everyone selfish. He said, nowadays, the way we live, we've got to give the pigs away because they're troublesome and they need to be eaten and you know all the rest of it. Yeah. He said, if I could store them, I'd become the selfish, self, most selfish person on the planet. <laughs> it's yeah. a very insightful discussion about uh, about money. Anyway, hmm. I, 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 you, you are currently in pain. I feel bad <laughs> keeping you. <laughs> What's that? I feel bad keeping you. Are you okay? Is yeah, no, life? I've just got a cramp in my leg. I, I was exercising and chopping wood before I came here, and I think sitting in one position too long has cramped my yeah. glutes. But anyway, I bet I better go, Shane. <laughs> yeah, I'll let I'll let you get back to your family. Escaped sapiens.